On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the January 31st, 2022 edition of What The Ship, top five stories in the maritime sector. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. So we got a lot to hit here. Five big stories going on right now, a lot to choose from, but we're going to focus on just a couple of key ones here and get us going right into the news. So for story number one, Story number one takes us to off the coast of the Netherlands, where a bulk carrier has been abandoned and is taking on water off the Dutch coast. This story in GCAP by Mike Schuller. A major rescue is underway for an abandoned bulk carrier taking on water off the Dutch coast. The Dutch Coast Guard is responding to an adrift bulk carrier that earlier collided with an oil chemical tanker off the port of Imuden in the Netherlands. The unladen bulk carrier, Juliet D, was reported adrift in the vicinity of the Hollandas Kust Zwied offshore wind farm, the Coast Guard reported. All 18 crew members have been evacuated and the ship is reported to be taking on water. Earlier, the Juliet D collided with the chemical tanker Paroka Star at the anchorage. Paroka Star is reported to be stable and not lost any cargo, the Coast Guard said. So we have a couple of images here coming off Twitter showing the position of the ship along with some images of it. And this story right here from a Dutch site actually has more details and a picture of it. And it shows you right here, the massive hole that's in the port quarter, the left rear part of the vessel. The reason that damage is so significant, this is a bulk carrier and it's obviously an empty bulk carrier. She's riding high out of the water. Had she been hit forward in her forward holds, those holds are designed to take cargo on board. What is taking water right now is the engine room. Now, one of the saving things here is it appears that the forward part of the vessel is without cargo. If the ship had been fully loaded and then took water in the engine room, that's a death sentence. Ship's going down. There's almost no way to stop the vessel from sinking. In this scenario, it depends on the stability of the vessel, whether or not she can stay afloat with her engine room flooded, but her forward compartments not. So that's gonna be all the questions we'll need to see right here. You see in this video right here, helicopter images of the ship. She's lightly loaded. You can see Coast Guard coming in to basically rescue crew members off. I can't tell you the amount of danger involved in an operation like this for a couple of reasons. Number one, the ship is without power. So she is broached. She's sideways in the swells, rocking port to starboard. This helicopter has come down. The foremast right there is the big concern you have in having a rotor blade hit that forward mast. You don't want to go anywhere else in between, between the forward house and the fourth fourth crane or between the second and third crane. Even though you have a helicopter landing area right there, because of the pitching of the vessel, they've decided to go in on the bow. A, A really kind of dangerous scenario at least with that you only have to worry about one obstruction going in here between the second and third crane you would have to worry about two obstructions at the same time so fortunately the crew has been removed uh you see them kind of lowering somebody down at this moment that's probably a rescue swimmer off the coast guard helicopter to set up the evacuation of the crew and they seem to be getting out doesn't appear the vessel to be anchored right now probably because of deep water but the vessel is adrift at this time. So they're gonna have to worry about her coming ashore, breaking up, you name it, a whole series of problems associated with this and all the best luck to the crew and those who are trying to rescue the vessel. You'll see her right here off the Hague right now. Well, that's story number one. Story number two is an op-ed in G Captain by John Conrad. John is the CEO, founder of G Captain. And I know John really well, but John wrote this op-ed. Could the Federal Reserve fix our ports? CNBC editor Lorianne LaRocco is a superstar. Excuse me. CNBC editor Lorianne LaRocco is a superstar in the world of logistics and seaborne trade. LaRocco's tirelessly and timely reports on the port congestion and the effects of COVID on the supply chain have been excellent. So I was shocked to find myself disagreeing with her latest Freight Waves editorial titled Viewpoint, one piece of the inflationary puzzle the feds can't control. And I've got that story right here. I was going to talk about this story, 
but John has already kind of jumped ahead of this. So let's look at what John writes. In the article, LaRocco says the Federal Reserve has many tools to address inflation, but there is nothing it can do to tackle one of the greatest inflationary pressures facing the country, supply chain costs. She says that the Fed has, quote, no control over port congestion, which is the cement in the trade pipes. Poor schedule reliability as a result of the congestion and finally China and its zero COVID policies, all three have created delays that drive up ocean freight costs. LaRocco, and this is John, is correct on all accounts, so why do I disagree so fully? So first off, the Fed recently put this out. This is a statement by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a new barometer of global, global supply chain pressure. Sorry, had a hard time talking today. Published on January 4th, this is their new barometer for measuring basically global supply chain. It's called the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, the GSCPI. I don't think that's going to catch on at all. But anyway, it basically uses a series of indexes and compiles them together roughly to create a new one, this new global supply chain pressure index. And they are using this to basically measure the impact. And one of the things that they showed in this that the global supply chain pressure remains high, but may have begun to moderate. Now, I, I have a question with that. They're basically coming at this because it's reached its highest peak ever. And their opinion is like, well, it's its highest peak ever. It's got to start coming down. I don't know about that. Anyway, back to John talking about Lorianne LaRocco's piece. The term failure of imagination first showed up in most people's radar early this century. It was invoked by the 9-11 Commission and other government officials. So John's talking about this idea that we're not thinking about everything. He then goes on to talk about the, the psychology of government incompetence. We do like to talk about government incompetence. It's one of the things we all kind of talk about. And I, I do disagree with that. I do think that government can do some positive things. I know a lot of people don't, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for that. But highways, transcontinental railroads, there are things that they can do. Do they do them well? Not always. But, you know, the space program, probably a pretty successful NASA thing that we've now transitioned over to commercial. Uh, at adaptability and the Fed. So if the Federal Reserve does not have the tools to fight port congestion to fix the U.S. merchant marine, does not, does not have a mandate to do so, then does not much institutional knowledge about shipping. Why do they explore the unknown? What can Fed governors possibly do to help the supply chain? He goes on here to talk about how can the Federal Reserve help shipping? I do not have any specific answers, but neither did the Fed on the onset of the global financial crisis in 2008. LaRocco is correct. The Fed does not have the tools to help shipping, but that does not prevent them from creating new tools. This is something I agree with, that one of the problems has been that the tools that have existed in the past have been dismantled slowly but surely over time. If the Federal Reserve can purchase land via mortgage-backed securities, and could it purchase port infrastructure and shipyard development bonds? Could it back the enormous risk lenders take when underwriting loans to U.S. shipping companies? I don't know, and neither does the Fed. And I think that's a big question to ask. Government investment in shipping has been done at many times. It was done during the Shipping Act of 1916. It was done under the Merchant Marine Act of 1936 and 1970. It's been done at times to mitigate risk of investment in shipping. Because in truth, when you invest in shipping, you don't get immediate returns for years at time. So back to John's article, what can the Fed do today is invite experts like Lorian LaRocco and federal agencies like Marid to help them better understand the problem. Me, I'll help. I'll, I'd love to help. They can then use their enormous media and political influence to inform and educate the public about the true nature of the problem we face at sea. It's, you know, the problem we're facing today is massive. I got a great note from one of my Patreon subscribers who thanked me for continuing saying what's going on in LA and Long Beach, even though I get harangued by LA and Long Beach and even by some mainstream shipping media who told me that I was wrong. And yet now they've basically sat there and said, listen, what's going on is not good because it's not being fixed. When you look at stories like this, Sam Chambers over at 24, uh, Splash 24-7, liner schedule reliability falls off a cliff. Sam is 
being nice to a cliff. I, I think this is a more, <laughs> this is worse than a cliff. I don't know what's worse than a cliff, but this is pretty bad in terms of reliability. If you look at individual companies, man, it's terrible. Shipping companies are making record profits for the worst reliability in their history. Uh, it's also over at Container News, the same thing, that graph, that red line graph that shows you where reliability is, the reliability of companies. It's terrible. And yet one of the things we're seeing is, listen, there's not a lot that we can do to fix this. And I, and I disagree. I think there is. I think we need to go into it. And I think Lorianne hits on a key issue right here. I mean, she's addressing the fact that the Fed do not have the mechanisms to make change. Agree entirely. We need those mechanisms. And so how do we go forward in doing this? We dismantled the FMC under the Shipping Act of 1984 and the Ocean Reform Act of 1998. Maybe we need to undo some of those. That's what the House is trying to do with the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2021. However, they're running into opposition from entities like the World Shipping Council. So there's a lot of players here. And what we need is to get a better handle on the situation. And discussions like this, I think, are essential. I really do, especially among people who are looking at the shipping industry and writing about it, like Lorianne Loraco and John Conrad. So that's st story number two. Story number three rolls into the same story I've been talking about, about the looming supply crisis we're having with LA and Long Beach. Uh, again, LA just published their numbers for December. They're down 10% in imports and overall containers than what they did last year at this time, meaning that the second half of 2021 was less than what they did in 2020. Even though it's a record year, they're down. And large part of that has to do with issues within the terminals and the operation of the port. And this story right here goes to it even further. This is a Reuters story and G Captain. January COVID cases among US West Coast longshore workers top 2021 total. About 1,700 dock workers at West Coast ports have tested positive for COVID in January, stretching capacity at U.S. busiest gateway for shipping containers. The number of infections for this port compare with 1,624 for all of 2021. In one month, there are more positives in West Coast ports than there was in the entire year. And this is going to mean shutdowns. This is going to mean slowdowns. This is going to add to the constraints already in those ports. Add to it this one, this is a CNBC report right here. Disruptions in China can lead to ripple effects across global supply chain, says HSBC. We know that COVID, uh, China has a zero tolerance for COVID. When they have an outbreak, they shut down. They shut down ports, terminals, you name it, they shut it down. And we're seeing that happen. We've seen that happen over the past couple of months with Omicron. This, along with what's going on in the West Coast ports, add the Chinese New Year, which may or may not be a slowdown, as we're thinking, because if ports are shutting down already, they may not slow down for February 1st. We'll see tomorrow when that hits. Add to it the ILWU renegotiation, which still is in, in, in discussion. Uh, I expect them to come to a settlement of some kind, but as long as there is no settlement in place, Shippers are going to front load their cargo. They're going to shift cargo from the second half of 2021 to the first half, or they're going to route to the East Coast and Gulf Coast via the Panama Canal or on the ultra large container vessels that run from East Asia to Europe and then on the smaller vessels over into US ports on the East and Gulf Coast. All of this means that we're not out of COVID yet. And the number of disruptions we suffer because of these types of slowdowns will continue to resonate throughout the supply chain. Don't think for a minute we're out of Christmas. <clears throat> we're out of the supply chain crunch. The White House has said everything's better. We're not. There's still a lot of issues underlying this, is this, this surface. And if we ignore them, they're going to rear their head again in a few months when we go into peak season for 2022 and we find ourselves right back to where we were in 2021. That's the reason I keep on this story because if you get complacent, it's gonna come back and bite us in the container. I was trying to be nice there. That's story number three. <clears throat> All right, story number four, let me be clear. I worked and sailed 
on ships, I know the type of pollution that ships can do. And it's, it, it's tremendous. We, we need to do better. We really do. We can't be dumping stuff in the ocean the way we used to. <clears throat> this is a major concern. However, this story that's on freight waves by Alyssa Spooner really bothers me because I've seen this on several other sites too. World's busiest trans-Pacific shipping lane targeted as Green Corridor. Go down here. The ports of Shanghai and Los Angeles in partnership with shipping lines and cargo owners are working to transition to zero carbon fueled ships by 2030 and reduce gas emissions along the world's busiest container shipping route. On Friday, the party's committed to delivering an implementation plan for the green shipping corridor by the end of 2022. Jump forward here. Despite growing efforts to adapt more sustainable fuels and strategy, a recent report said that shipping related greenhouse gases emissions rose by 4.9% in 2021. Shipping emissions are expected to double by 2050 at, in a business as usual scenario. So let me be clear. IMO is targeting a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. What this is talking about is zero between Shanghai and Los Angeles. Shanghai is the largest port in the world. Los Angeles is the largest, largest container port in the United States. And this target is going to have massive implications. You're talking about, number one, not allowing certain ships on this route. You're going to kick vessels off, which is great. That will help alleviate the congestion I get. But you're also going to astronomically increase costs because you can only use these vessels on this specific route if you establish a unique parameter here. Uh, you're talking about implementing a strategy in front of the global strategy. And understand, when you do that, you're going to add costs about this. Just look at what California does in regards to trucks and emissions. It excludes a lot of trucks and, and that could potentially operate in the ports for their emissions. And I understand all about this. I mean, we need to get green and we need to clean up what's being dumped. But the idea that the port of Shanghai and Los Angeles are going to do this themselves it also has this concept that ships only operate between Shanghai and Los Angeles. It doesn't, they operate on multiple routes. Shanghai and Los Angeles are just two stops on multiple routes at times. And, and you're gonna build ships just for a specific, I mean a specific route to do this. Listen, the container companies are working on this. They are flush with cash. The technology hasn't come out yet that has given them zero greenhouse gas emissions. We're already up because of the huge demand spike in shipping. And now you want to throw on top of this, listen, Shanghai to LA is going to be zero gas emissions. I, I, I mean, it's good to be ambitious. It's good to be bold and ambitious. It is wrong to be absolutely out of reach ambitious. Set a goal which can't possibly be obtained, in my opinion, by 2030. I mean, 2030, it's eight years, not even eight years away. And, and you're talking about creating building ships that are zero emission that can sail from Shanghai to Los Angeles and back again. That is, is, is literally, I, I mean, you can do it, but this is JFK putting a man on the moon types technology you're talking about here. You're talking about a bold endeavor within less than a decade. And I'm not sure that this helps us in the current situation we're in. We need the IMO to be pushing this nationally. What, is it, what, what good does it do to be zero gas emissions from Shanghai to Los Angeles when from Shanghai to the east coast of Africa, you're dumping all the pollutants in the world out there? And, and again, this needs to be a global endeavor, not just on a specific route. And so this story, I, I know it shouldn't, I shouldn't let it bother me, but it, it, it did a little bit because of everything that's going on. This seems to be very ambitious in a period of time when we should be focusing on several other things. And more importantly, this should be being handled at a much higher level than between the ports of Shanghai and Los Angeles. So that's story number four. Story number five, last but not least, Sam Chambers caught my attention with this story. 
on Splash 24-7, Chinese desk manufacturer orders 1,800 TEU box ship. As Sam talks about in this story, it was in June last year that Splash first reported of a major retailer, Home Depot, chartering in container tonnage to battle the ongoing supply chain crisis. Hello, did a video on that too, based on largely Sam and many other maritime reporters' works. Put that out there. We were talking about Walmart. We were talking about Target. We were talking about Ikea, Home Depot, you name it. Anyway, he goes on there. Since then, a host of other major retailers, including Walmart and Ikea, have pursued similar tactics. Now, one Chinese manufacturer has taken the next step. Clarkson Research Services. Clarkson is, is really a huge research service when it comes to shipping, way outside my budget to, to get their services, is reporting Lucktech Egonomic. I'm not going to even get that word right, has ordered an 1800 TEU ergonomic. It's ergonomic. I am so bad. I apologize. I don't have my glasses on. Loctec ergonomic has ordered a 1800 TEU box ship from Hung Hai Shipbuilding for swift delivery in the first quarter next year. That is, that is a, a swift delivery. The Ningbo headquartered desk manufacturer has managed to negotiate a competitive $32.6 million for the new ship, where a secondhand tonnage for similar size ships is now trading at around 50 million in order to further enhance the company's competitiveness and accelerate the company's overseas business development the company plans to sign a 1800 tu container ship construction contract with a domestic first class shipyard so this means you're getting back into what's called proprietary shipping where companies own their own shipping vessel in other words this company, Loctec Ergonomic, Ergonomic, I'm sorry, I'm terrible, I can't read. We, instead of putting their boxes on a major carrier, Maersk, Costco, Hophog, they're going to have their own dedicated ship because they see dedicated service as being essential. And so they're going to be able to load, or load this vessel with their goods, which are basically these, 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 these adjustable desks, standing desks, basically, and ship them over. Now, I, I don't know how much these companies are really looking into this because the costs associated with operating a vessel, issues with labor, and the fact that this vessel at times is going to be out of service for, for maintenance, you're not going to be able to fill this vessel all the time, so you're going to have to get other cargo to put on it. I can understand some companies wanting to go proprietary. I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens with the big firms. Amazon, Ikea, but, but they're not doing that. They know not to do this. And I think we're going to see these little companies get into these proprietary shipping agreements. It, it's interesting to watch. And it'll be, I, I like I said, I'm going to be fascinated to see what happens with this. This may be the solution. Who knows? Uh, especially if their 1800 TU box has cranes, uh, they can go into other ports beyond the big ones. If they can go into Port Wainimi, they can go into Oregon, Washington, Houston, New Orleans, Mobile, whatever. They can go into other ports besides the big ones. This may be a good solution. The other problem you have too is, is the demand and the supply chain issue still going to be going on when they get this vessel in 2023? That's the hedge here that's going to be interesting to follow. So anyway, five stories which cover the spectrum from a bulk vessel in distress and sinking off the coast of Netherlands to the construction of a new container ship uh, being used by a company, uh, ergonomic company, ergonomics, for the distribution of their own goods. I, it, it definitely covers the spectrum. Uh, there's no doubt. There's a lot going on with shipping. So I hope you found the video enjoyable. And if you did, and if you found it useful, please subscribe. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they co come out. Leave a comment. Give it a thumbs up, share it across the social medium spectrum. Be sure to let other people know about what's going on with shipping. And if you can, if you can, please contribute to Patreon. That helps me keep doing what I'm doing. It gives me great feedback, as I told you at the beginning of the video, from my subscribers. I appreciate all my Patreon members. I appreciate a lot getting a new camera from my office at home. So you'll see me in this clear, perfect image. Not perfect, because this is not perfect. But you'll see me. Uh, a lot clearer from my home office versus just my, sh my uh, work office. So until our next video, this is Sal signing off.